Hello Grade 12s. In this lesson, we will focus on the acid-base indicators and the strength of an acid and a base. Today, Tracy is going to take us through the acid-base reaction. She will explain to us the differences between strong and weak acids and bases. We will also get to know more about acid-base indicators. Let's join her now. So, starting with, what is a strong and a weak acid? Now, what's really important here is we define a strong acid, an acid which ionizes almost completely. Now, I've deliberately gone and bolded and underlined ionize because you've got to remember that all your acids are covalently bonded molecules, grade 11s. So that means they're not naturally ionic. So they haven't given away electrons, they haven't taken electrons, they're sharing them. So what happens is when the acid dissolves in water, we have to force it to become ions, and that's really, really important. With a strong acid, it desperately wants to become ions. So when we look at a strong acid like hydrochloric acid, when it reacts with water, and what's very important here is that we say it is reacting with the water, it's part of the reaction, okay? We end up with H3O plus ions because what's happened is the chlorine, the hydrochloric acid, has given its hydrogen away. It's acted like an acid. Remember, acids are proton donors. We did that last week. The water acts like a base, takes the hydrogen, ends up with H0 plus and Cl minus. Now, this is a strong acid, so that means when I look at this, if I could look at the solution from a mi a, in a microscope and I could actually see the little molecules everywhere, there would be lots of H3 plus and Cl minus. And remember, I said to you last week as well, that it's this H3 plus that makes it so dangerous, okay? It's the H3 plus ion that, that um, corrodes, that eats away skin and metal and all those wonderful nasty things, moving on. So, when we look at a weak acid, and, some, and it's hard to see it from the equation because of the way we write the equation at this level. When you get to grade 12, you're going to do a thing called chemical equilibrium, and you're going to do the whole thing with reversible reactions, which you've seen. And this is, we're going to rewrite these equations with the sign doing this. Little sign to the right, sorry, big sign to the right, little sign to the left. And that tells me that I have lots and lots of ions in there. With my weak acid, like acetic acid or ethanoic acid, vinegar, okay? Remember, it's only that little hydrogen at the end that's important. The one that's bonded to the carbon isn't important, okay? It doesn't make it acidic. That hydrogen comes along, donates itself to the, to the water, okay? Off it goes. Once again, we get H3 plus ions, and now we get the CH3COOH minus, okay? This is a weak acid though, so what that means is that when this dissolves in the water, we get it to ionize, but we don't get a lot of product. There's very little of this. So because there's so little H3O+, it's not very dangerous. Doesn't mean that it can't do damage, okay? So what I'm saying to you is don't go and drink a whole bottle of vinegar. You are going to feel fairly sick after that if you can actually get it done. Okay, so you've got to be careful because remember your stomach's got acid in it. You don't want to add to that, okay? But lucky for us, vinegar, if you spill it on your table at home, isn't going to eat through your table, okay? Which is a good thing. So acids ionize. Very, very important. A base, oh sorry, before we get there, now I've got a list here. And this course is in the notes you can download. Please, grade 11s. You have to just learn this. This isn't something where I can say to you, look at the structure, look at how many hydrogens there are, because it doesn't work like that, okay? And these are your common acids. So these are the acids you're most likely to find at school. These are the ones we're going to deal with, with ca calculations, with experiments, all of that sort of stuff, and they expect you to know whether they're strong or weak, particularly for next year, because next year, we're going to look at titration in a lot more detail than we're doing this year. And in fact, you're going to have to calculate final pHs. It's going to get all nice and hairy for you guys. It's great fun. And from knowing whether you have a strong acid and a strong base, you have to choose what indicator you're going to use. So that's really, really important. And unfortunately, this is one of those things you just have to learn. Okay? I know, I mean, I still get confused at times, but I know them because we use them all the time. First four, hydrochloric, nitric, 
sulfuric, phosphoric, these are all strong acids. Phosphoric isn't that strong, but it's still classified as a strong acid. Then we get carbonic, and remember I told you last time, carbonic acid is what you find in your fizzy cold drinks. In fact, you find a little bit of phosphoric acid too, okay? And carbonic acid's the one that they reckon will rot your teeth, and you can use to marinate meat, and all those fun things, okay? Ethanoic acid, which you know is vinegar, and then oxalic acid. This one's quite an unusual one. Don't stress at this point about its structure and the fact that it's COOH in brackets. You're going to deal with it when you do organic. Okay, the nice thing about these two is you're going to remember how to name them and draw them when you do organic chemistry next year, which is actually going to be a lot of fun. Okay, so that brings us to bases. Now, a base dissociates. There's only one exception to that, and I'll talk about that in a second. Bases dissociate because bases are ionic. Bases are made up of your negative ion, which is usually OH, but it doesn't have to be. It can be um, nitrogen, it can be carbonate, it can be um, oxygen. So it's a negative ion with a metal, generally speaking, except ammonia. Ammonia is your exception to this whole thing. So ammonia is the only base you have that's covalent. Most of your other bases are ionic. Now what that means is when they get added to water, they split apart. They dissociate from each other. Much like water's like that third wheel. You know what I mean? You have a friend and your best friends and then water happens. Generally it's a boy, okay, if it's two <laughs> girls. And then you decide you don't want to have anything to do with each other anymore, okay? Because, you know, water got in the way. And if you don't, you know, sometimes that dissociation is fairly permanent and sometimes you actually manage to get over it and, you know, kick the boy out and you become friends again. All right. But what does that mean? Water doesn't actually take part in the reaction. So look at the difference in the way we write this. Here I have sodium hydroxide. The water gets put on the top. It gets put in the arrow because it's not part of the product. And literally, I'm splitting the sodium hydroxide in half. So I'm breaking it up into its ions, Na plus OH minus, okay? I could write it with the water in the middle. So then I'm going to get the fact that water's starting to act like a um, acid in this case, but that gets quite complicated with what we're trying to do, okay? But it's a strong base. NOH is a very, very, very strong base. It's caustic soda. It is extremely dangerous, okay? It's not one of those things you should have in your home, and if you do, I'm a little worried, and it's one of those things that we use as industrial cleaners, very, very dangerous, can burn you, and, and uh, this is one of my pet peeves, it can burn you as badly as an acid can, okay? Mm. And in fact, when you mix sodium hydroxide into a solution, if you're not careful, it can bubble up so much that if it gets in your eye, it can blind you. It's very, very dangerous, okay? And Looney, remember last week we spoke about that episode of the program, it's actually CSI. Yes, yes. And a guy the falls guy into the pool. pool. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not pretty. <laughs> and it's only with organic material. Sodium hydroxide loves organic material, okay? So I'd be fairly safe in my clothes because I think most of it's synthetic. <laughs> so we'd be fine. Okay. Your weak bases, something like your carbonates, generally carbonates are weak bases, also dissociate, breaks where the metal is, breaks up into two, okay? What's important here is you've got to remember what your polyatomic ions look like, what their charge is, and all of that sort of thing. Now, there's an exception to grade 11, so I want you to just pay attention to this, and that's ammonia. Ammonia is actually a weak base. We use it at home a lot. It's a very good cleaning agent. You smell it in Handy Andy and all of those sort of products, so they are moving away from it because it's toxic, not because it's a base, but just because it is toxic, just in the format that it is. And ammonia has that very pungent, it, it feels like it's burning your nose and your eyes, and it's just not pretty. And in fact, you get FIVS ammonia, which is only, I think, 33% dilution. But if you don't wear gloves when you use this, like you, it actually burns the first layer of your skin. Mm. And it t your skin feels like leather and it peels. And yes, I'm talking from experience, but we'll move on. Okay, <laughs> always read the instructions. I'm just Yo. saying. Yeah, I was young. Okay, okay at least it went like now. I'd Ooh, be no way, I learned my lesson okay. the first time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now, with ammonia, ammonia is going to have to ionize, okay? Ammonia is not 
ionic. It's two non, it's two non metals, which means the water is going to act like an acid, give its hydrogen to the ammonia, and it's going to give us the ammonium ion. So that should be plus, and that's minus. Now you've seen this before, grade 11s. Beginning of the year, you did covalent bonding and you did dative covalent bonding. This was one of the ones you had to learn to do. So there's lots of stuff involved in the ammonia. Okay, and remember, this is my base. This is its conjugate acid. Ammonia is your exception to dissociation. It ionizes. Now, just like with your acids, you have to learn your list of strong acids and bases. See, Lini, the board doesn't like me again. Telling you. Okay. Generally, now this one, it's a little bit easier to find a trend because if you look at all my strong bases, ammonium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, there are exceptions. These are the ones you need to know. The hydroxide makes it a strong base, okay? The rest, now we've got carbonates. Carbonates are actually very weak bases, which we're glad about because remember, sodium bicarbonate, baking powder, you use it at home. You don't want to be using things like sodium hydroxide when you cook cakes, unless you're trying to kill someone, which we, not, we do not no, approve no, of. No. Okay, so <laughs> your carbonates are weak bases. Very, very important. Your hydroxides are strong bases. Now we know the difference between a strong acid and a weak acid, a strong base and a weak base. Let us now move straight on to indicators. We are going to give Tracy the time to explain to us how blue litmus paper works in an acid. You've all seen blue litmus, okay? You've all seen, oh look, it matches my nails. That wasn't deliberate, okay? So you all see blue litmus paper. And this is the one indicator you guys all can tell me. So if I take some blue litmus and I'm gonna put it into my first test tube and we're gonna see what happens, okay? It's going to get it a bit wet. There we go. And I have my white paper. And we all got, see it went pink. Yay. And hopefully you guys are sca st scaring the TV. Let's not scare the TV. Let's scream into the TV. That means this is an acid. Absolutely. Okay. This is one of our indicators. Now, what I actually have in this test tube is a, a solution of acetic acid, otherwise known as vinegar. Diasha will now show us how other indicators work in different substances. Here I have two solutions of sodium hydroxide with their concentrations marked on them. The first solution has a concentration of 0,1 molar and the second 0,04 molar. Now remember that even though both these solutions are diluted, they are still both solutions of a strong base. By diluting the alkali, there is a difference between the samples, but when I test them, I notice that they both turn pink litmus blue. Now, there must be a better way to indicate how basic or acidic solutions are. We will need a better indicator to show us this difference. When we used our natural indicators, you notice that not all indicators have the same colors in acidic and basic solutions. This gave chemists the idea of combining different chemicals that change color when there are even small changes in acidity. They called this indicator a universal indicator. This indicator can be used as either a paper indicator like the litmus paper we have been using or as a liquid that can be added to solution. This liquid can only be used when the solutions being tested are colorless. Let's take a look now at how sensitive this universal indicator actually is. I'm going to add a few drops to each sample of the sodium hydroxide solutions I prepared earlier. Look here, the 0,1 molar solution has turned a darker purple while the 0,04 molar solution is a lighter purple. This color change now gives us a way of measuring small changes in acidity. 
This indicator is the tool we can use to develop a range of different levels of acidity. Now before we use it to do some more testing, we need to link this indicator to a scale scientists have developed in order to link color changes on the indicator to a number. This scale for measuring acidity is called the pH scale. It starts at 0 and runs through to 14. You may be wondering why the scale is called pH. Well, when scientists were developing theories about why some things are acids and others are neutral or basic, they noticed that in acids the number of hydrogen ions was very high. A hydrogen ion is actually a hydrogen atom without its electron. This explains why the scale is called pH. There is a mathematical relationship between the pH value and the hydrogen ion concentration that may seem strange at first, but I'll try to simplify it for you. When the concentration of hydrogen ions is high, the substance is acidic and the pH value will be low. Strong concentrated acids have pH values of 0 or 1. Weak acids can have pH values of 4 or even 5. Neutral substances, like water, have a pH of 7. When the hydrogen ion concentration decreases, the substance is now a base and the pH values will now be above 7. Weak bases have pH values of 8 or 9, while strong concentrated alkalis have pH values of 13 or 14. Now the best thing about universal indicator is that it links directly to the pH scale. So we can use the paper or the liquid indicator, check the color and read off the indicator. Did you notice that pink litmus paper turns blue in a base? But Tracy also showed us that blue litmus paper turns pink in an acid. And when using universal indicator paper, we would get a range of different colors that tell us the pH of the substance. If the color of universal indicator paper is red, orange, or yellow, on the left side of this color reference, the substance would be an acid. If the color of the universal indicator paper is blue or purple, the substance is a base, as seen on the right of the color reference. Substances that are neutral will turn the paper green. Grade 12s, we'll learn more about the pH scale in a later lesson. This brings us to the end of our lesson on the definition of an acid and a base according to the Lowry Brownstead model. You'll also find more information about acids and bases at www.mindset.co.za/learn. Remember to try some of the questions in the task video. Goodbye.